Thank you. Thanks, Joe. A lot of information. Very engaging. I think we're going to have lots of questions. Well, thank you, Joe. That was great. Uh, I read about the project as well, but I was really excited that I am really looking forward to the book and this article. One of the things that you touched upon in the things that I come across as well, which is I'm not sure if it's you you painted sort of as academics wanting to be relevant and that will find religion. There is also I think in naivety of culture. And that's what you also see when you discuss religion in law, where you definitions, scholarly definitions of religion are weaponized depending on what you have you in court. And scholars of religion don't really think about this. They might be the dominant. That their particular definition goes up in a court, but they don't think about the implications of what could happen. So it's, it can also be like a chain, it can also be the various channels. Uh, I have three sort of interconnected questions. Uh, one of them is very simple. I'm sort of, of course, this is just an article, and I think your book will discuss this more, but could you say something about whether teachers' union is Because I, I'm sort of missing. The opponents. And to some degree related to that, I'm also missing Europe. Because if you look at America and Japan, you have sudden removal of religion from schools, followed by the gradual return of religion to school. I mean, the question of how do we get religion back to school? But if you look at the European process, it tends to be the different movement. The post war period would have secularization of religious education in Europe. And I know that. Japanese sociologists of education, for instance, are very interested in European and especially Northern European ways of teaching religion. So I was wondering if you want to say something about that sort of divide. And then you also you, you focus on Buddhism here. Uh, and I'm sort of, I can't stop thinking about it. This is I just of course, but Shinjo no Mori. And like if you read the uh, for you have this constant discussion about the role of trying for a sin in training you to not be violent and annoying. And this is basically, if you go back to 2000, what Yoshiro made his statement. I mean, look at I mean, what he was talking about is not just the land of the gods, it was how do we use Shinju no Mori to solve the problem of you being violent. So I was wondering if you to say some things more about the Shinto and, and well, that was too much, me, but thank you. We'll talk more later. That's, that's really great. Um, I should have said it. I meant to say at the very beginning of my talk, my editor said that my book is too long. And so, so then I was just like, when Matt invited me to do this after the editor, Matt invited me to do this first. Then the editor said the book was too long. And then I just like looked at the manuscript and I was like, I can take all this stuff out and you can make it into an article, which meant that I left out a bunch of the other contents, uh, which is all the stuff that you asked about. It. Teachers' unions and the Ministry of Education have these great fights, especially over morality time. Um, the notion of morality education and then morality time. One of the chapters of my book looks at um, this in the 1950s and, and early 1960s, like both before morality time is introduced and then after. Um, and the unions are, as I briefly mentioned in this talk, um, they're generally adopting the attitude that um, moral problems are best solved through social solutions. And if you solve social inequalities, then all the moral stuff will sort of shake out. And the, um, the conservatives, but the far right conservatives and the center right conservatives are generally approaching more like, no, you need to make the human good first, and then society will call it. This is like a chicken and egg sort of thing that there's never going to be a good, like people aren't ever going to see eye to eye on, on this sort of thing. But um, what I think is really fascinating and a story that I get into more in chapter three of my book is that um, there are two films that were released within a year of each other um, that were both sort of visions of how um, morality education was supposed to work. One of the films was Mountain Ethnos, uh, um, which was based on a, a novel which was based on or like a sort of autobiography, which was written by a Buddhist priest who became a school teacher in Yamagata and in a very impoverished village. And this got turned into this um, film, which is a fairly clunky film by our standards today, but it was really inspiring for uh, members of the teachers union at the time. And what's striking is that 
they really found this uh, this priest, uh, Muchaku Chien, I think is his name. Uh, but they found him um, to be a very inspiring figure. Uh, and he regularly toggles between his role as somebody who is a Buddhist priest who will like chant a sutra with you and somebody who's going to do like really engaged um, pedagogy with a bunch of impoverished students. So the teachers love this. They're not anti religion although that school is, or that film does show uh, a lot. It, it shows a number of the so-called new religions in a very negative light. But um, so they're not anti-religion. They just think that it needs to be abstracted to such a degree that it can be focused much more on the issues of social inequality. Um, whereas the, uh, another film that was produced um, by the Ministry of Education focuses on inequality, but it puts the burden on the teacher to make the kids good. Um, and that was uh, shot by Hani Susumi, who's a famous experimental uh, filmmaker from the time. Hani would go on to also make a 1961 film called Uyo Shonen, which is a sort of like semi-documentary um, about juvenile delinquents. Um, I'm getting, I, I'm just, I, let me, I'm going to stop myself. We'll talk more. Uh, let me talk about Europe really quickly and then about Hanshi. The place where Europe, uh, I think, comes in, one of the places where Europe comes in, uh, very interesting to me, and I, I was sort of surprised, is Nippon Kaigi likes Europe. Nippon Kaigi likes the UK. They like Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher's educational reforms. And when they were uh, looking in the late 1990s and early 2000s uh, to, um, for a model for like, how to revise the fundamental law in education, um, they were like, well, let's do what Thatcher did. And it, there are like titles in their uh, monthly magazine, Nihonomibuki, that's like, learn from Thatcher, right? Or like, let's do it the Thatcher way, right? And, um, and at first I was like, what's going on here? But it's because of the neoliberal approach to responsibilizing young people and making them take, um, shoulder the burden of their own successes and failures, um, while also... Uh, loosening the, the America style restraints on um, you know, religion state relations. And then finally, for Shinto stuff, um, the Shinto Seiji Renme has gotten a lot more into um, making comments about public education. Um, and I'm going to, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to say much about that, but I'll just say, like, whereas before they were quite quiet about it, in the 90s and since they've been like, fairly active and, and have been. Um, you know, pushing for some major education. Um, and when they talk about constitutional revision, by the way, the one clause that they always go to first is Article 20, Clause 3. And that's the clause that prohibits religious education. Okay? Um, they, they talk about that one first, not Article 89, which I think is really interesting, uh, which is Article 89 for those one knows the one that prohibits state uh, expenditures of funds on religious rituals. Um, so, uh, the fact that they would prioritize Article 20, Clause 3 over Article 89 su suggests to me that they're, they're treating education as being important because it's, they're playing a long game. Thank you very much. Um, so if I may take us back for a moment to the occupation period. Yes. Um, you know, MacArthur was famously very keen on trying to make Japan a Christian nation, using Christianity to fill the so-called spiritual vacuum. And I'm sure you're, you know that there's a brief period of several years in the immediate post-war years when there was a sort of nationwide Christian boom and a lot of uh, enrollments soared at Christian mission schools that were had been previously marginalized during the war and so on and so forth. Um, my understanding is that this kind of Christian boom at a societal level died off pretty much when MacArthur left and as the occupation ended. Uh, and you gave illuminating examples today about how Buddhists tried to sort of establish themselves within the sort of post-war Japanese religious education. So I was wondering, in your eyes, did Christianity have any sort of lasting impact on the direction of religious education in post-war Japan? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think the answer, the short answer is yes, uh, but indirectly. So um, some of, I, I had to skip over it in, in, for the interest of time, but some of the main figures who um, were responsible for establishing occupation education policy were affiliated with the American Council on Education, which was an organization that was actually pro-religious education. 
And um, some of the advisors to the occupation, um, like there's this guy, Paul Beef, uh, who was a, a who taught at Yale Divinity School, um, who wrote a book called The Church and Christian Education. And he was very much into the idea that both Americans and Japanese needed to have some sort of religious education. So I, I think that idea filtered into some of the policies that were adopted um, both by the occupiers, but then indirectly, even in things like the fundamental law and education, uh, there's a sort of implicit, tacit, quasi-Christian notion that, like, uh, that religion is what makes people good, and that without religion, without Christian religion, you can't make good people. Um, one of the other things that happens, I, you're absolutely right, the Christian boom is short-lived, um, but Christian schools, both Sunday schools, but also just like Christian private schools, continue to flourish, and there are a number of Japanese people who are choosing to send their children to those Christian schools based on notions of a number of different things. Like they want to get like, some sort of moral training. They think of it as getting quality education. They might think of it as providing some sort of like, English training or whatever. Um, again, it's never been a huge amount of the population, but a decent number of Japanese people have grown up going to those Christian schools and, and so forth. One thing that I guess links back to Odium's talk too is that the Buddhists are constantly measuring themselves against those Christian institutions. So when I talked about uh, an organization like Zen Seikyo, um, they're regularly thinking, well, what do the Christian Sunday schools do and how do we do that in a Buddhist way? Christians are good at social work and charity. How do we do something like that that's done in a Buddhist way? You know? So there's so even if people aren't going to the to the Christian um, institutions and the Buddhists are borrowing uh, sort of policies and models and trying to do that in their own way. Now, one other thing I want to say, this is actually about the United States, not about Japan, but I think it's crucial context, is that, you know, in the US, there is a, um, a widespread assumption that people send, to the, send their kids to a Christian school because of quality education. And that's the talking point. A lot of the um, Christian schools uh, that were founded in the same time period that I was talking about in the United States um, were not founded as Christian schools initially. They were founded as segregation academies uh, designed to sequester white children from black children after the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And um, when the um, Supreme Court and the IRS began cracking down on, this, on these institutions for the discriminatory policies, um, they linked up with churches like Baptist churches, and they started saying, we're, we, um, we're not discriminatory, we just offer a quality education. So I think we need to, uh, this is moves away from the content of your question, but I can't resist bringing it up here because those um, assertions that a lot of people make that link Christianity with quality education, they actually have a very sordid history in the United States. That's not the same history in, in, in Japan, but that I think we have to think about, well, what are the sort of like discursive things that are being borrowed across um, the Pacific? Like, are people in Japan hearing Christians, like say Japanese Christians, hearing Christians in the United States using this language of academic excellence, not recognizing the racist context in which it was generated and then reproducing it over here? I have to do more research on that particular thing, but I do think that that's really interesting um, context. And like I said, I couldn't resist throwing that out here. That's great, thank you. So first of all, I just want to thank you for uh, helping us think about our own profession and what we're doing. And I particularly appreciate the point about, you know, us telling people that they're really religious and we will tell them how, even though they deny being so. Uh, I think that's important for us to think about more. We do that a lot. Um, I just want to make a couple of bullet point comments and then I want to ask a, a, a more a detailed question. So the bullet point uh, things I want to mention are um, you talked about the idea of we're going to uh, make good people and we're going to make them rich. Uh, that reminded me of the civil back in the 1950s and 1960s is kind of what they were doing as, as well. Uh, which also brings the point of like religion is good, but certain religions are better than others. Like the new Buddhist movements are not as good as, as other things. Um, the final bullet point I'll, I'll make comment is kids these days 
Um, yes, kids these days, but what are we talking about when we say that kids these days? Different era refer to different things. So in the 1950s, the number of juvenile delinquents incarcerated was I think, significantly higher than the 1970s. So in terms of delinquency, we can talk about kids these days. So when we talk about kids these days in 2023, we're probably not talking about juvenile delinquents, we're, we're talking about something else. So the point is, when we say kids these days, because we're always talking about the same thing. Um, okay, finally, I want to get to the, the heart of my question, which is about citizen formation. Because this is what public education has been doing for a long time in Japan and America. And my question is basically this, so I'm going to give a little more background. But to put it bluntly, my question is this. How as scholars of religion do we deal with character formation that is labeled as non-religious. So you said something talking about the children Joso, who did the manipulative. Yeah, you, you said that you said uh, we're going to manipulate people and call that good. The first thing that struck my mind is mindfulness education in America today. Because that's what's going on there. We're going to manipulate their emotions, and this is good for them. Um the people promoting that are not religious studies scholars. To a large degree, certainly the people of Buddhist studies would be very much against that kind of idea. The whole idea that mindfulness is kind of this liberal, this, this neoliberal uh, inclusion in the schools. So my question is, how do we deal with things like choosing Kyoiku before the war, don't do Kyoiku after the war, um, sports clubs as a way, you know, uh, very low. Uh, and then also kind of the business training, you know, the PhD set up by Matsushima. So it's like, how do we as scholars of religion deal with the formation of people when we're not noticing these things as religious, when these things are kind of considered the non-religious or shukyo porn rather than actual shukyo? Yeah. I'm really glad you asked that question. It gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the book project, um, not just this article, but I'm going to try to be brief. One of the big problems that the academic study of religion has is that it already starts from the secularist premise that we can carve the world up into caps, like this is religion right here and that's not religion over there. It's built into the type of religious studies. Like we, we're already doing this. We already choose this stuff and we say this is within our purview. And I think that that's a problem. That's why I think, although the, the literature can be sometimes tendentious or, or unnecessarily abstract, I think that the critical secularism studies literature has been very helpful in getting people to pay attention to the basic presuppositions that we're bringing to our inquiry. So I think that one of the things that we have to do from the outset is to just say, um, these are the ways that I am choosing to carve up this world, but I actually think we do our best work when we describe other people's language games of defining religion, and we don't necessarily say we're doing that, or we try not to do that ourselves. I would much rather describe other people's religion making than engage in religion making myself. And indeed, my book that I'm working on right now, I describe as a religious studies book that's not about religion. In other words, it's a book that looks at all of the language games that people might play with words like religion and related words like morality and patriotism and sexuality and all this other stuff, words that can be coded as religious, but can just as easily be coded as not religious. I think that that reveals much more about the world we inhabit collectively than me going around and being like, this is the religion and I'm not going to pay attention to that stuff. So as a scholar, as a scholar of religion, I, it's impossible to have this conversation without using the argument. But as a scholar of religion, I'm, I will constantly be attracted to those places where people are trying to negotiate something to define something as being religious or not religious. But I'm, I'm allowing my gaze to be drawn to those sorts of things. And I think that that's valuable and good. And indeed, I think that that is why we are a discipline and not just a field, because we can do that rigorously in a way that nobody else can. The economists can't do it. The sociologists can't do it. This is why religious studies is a thing. This is why it matters, because we ask that question when nobody is from oh, soapbox. Okay, so um, so in the, in the book, my tool for getting at that is um, to focus on what I call promissory talk. 
And um, promissory talk is the opposite of counterfactual thinking about this. So I'm looking constantly at these ways where people will say, if only we do this, then this will happen. So if only we get the kids to do mindfulness, then they're going to be good. I literally heard people say, if only they do mindfulness, then they will get good. <laughs> if only we display the words, in God we trust on their school campus, then the kids won't do drugs. Utterly preposterous, literally in the, in the true sense of that term, it puts ends before beginnings. But I think that um, focusing on promissory talk is great because um, not only do we specialize as scholars of religion in uh, the ways that people carve up the world into religion and not religion, but we also specialize in people making irrational, preposterous claims. We're not going to be able to do anything um, policy wise about the character formation we personally may not like. But we can describe that policy formation in action. And when we do so publicly, then we bring it to people's attention. We have language for doing that. Uh, my language of promise is not necessarily like the best language for talking with the, the public, but like, um, but like when we do that, then it causes, then at least it has the possibility of encouraging people to be like, oh wait, well, what do we really mean we, when, when we're saying we want kids to do mindfulness? What do we really mean when we say, if only the kids had more national pride, then they wouldn't bully each other. That's the Japanese, one of the Japanese. So that's, um, so, so I'm, I'm gonna, dis I'm gonna be disciplined and just like cut myself off here, but, um, <laughs> but I think uh, your questions get exactly at some of the basic things that are at the heart of the book project. And I sort of artificially carved off a bunch of stuff for today's talk um, without offering that. Back. So, and so that's, that's what's going on there. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. That was great. I'd like to follow up on your earlier conversation with Ariel um, on actually two, two different points. And the first is the, the Shinto thing. Um, you started your talk with showing us those pictures of those ritual practices that we feel or most of us will probably feel uncomfortable with. Uh, and then, but then afterwards, you talk mostly about discourse, ideology, uh, talk about values. But not so much about what actually happens in the classroom. Um, and again, here's me being interested in ritual practice and things that people do. But I think what Shinto, when when around 1990s or so, like around the turn of the century, when they really became interested in this, it wasn't only about, of course, I thought to talk about values and morality, and but it was also about planting the tree, doing getting these big city kids to plant the rice or to harvest the rice, getting them to clap and bow to the, to the Kamidana uh, or, or the shrine. It's about the embodied practice um, that establishes a connection with the land, physical land. And, that, and that's, a, a, that's a particular move away from just the abstract uh, moral value type of, type of rhetoric that was there before. And I really think that so there's something Maybe too many comes in your book, but there's really something to, to think about. Well, what is the what is the embodied nature of these kind of practices? And that's just more like a, a, an observation. Something I want to add to that. My question has to do with your rather um, uh, okay. This is the devil's advocate here. Yes. I mean, I'm uh, have coming from Norway, where um, we have uh, all all children in the country are obliged to follow one or a couple of hours every week. A subject that is called, here we go, Christianity, religion, worldviews, and ethics, on, in that order, <laughs> establishing a hierarchy. Um, and here we have secular schools, public schools, um, basically prescribing a particular way of understanding religion and morality, right? I would imagine many, many religious studies scholars in Japan would look at that with, 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 with much interest. My interest in this is both professional and scholar of religion and personal to parents of children who have to take that class. Now, it'd be easy to do what you say and just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to analyze the language games by others, so that's interesting. And I agree, it's important work. But what I did is I went there and I gave a class, okay? So I went to the classroom and I had a group of, of, of eight years old, eight, eight year olds, and I talked about my research. So I sort of Step, I didn't do the meta thing anymore. I was like, okay, if, I, if you can't beat them, join it. So, but that's the exact kind of argument that many of my colleagues in religious studies in Norway are making. And that goes back to your point about the jobs. 
and about our graduates, our students. Many of our students, that's the kind of jobs that they get. They become teachers. This is their, the subject that they teach, right? So there is like, there, and, and that's their, whatever I'm critical of this kind of, this subject, that's what my public saying. I say, yeah, but I mean, you're in a, you're in a privileged position. You, you, I mean, you could, you have your university job, you could be critical, but many of our university graduates, right? They wouldn't have anywhere else to go with their expertise in religious studies than education. Uh, and we wouldn't want to take all those jobs away from us, would we? Right? So, <laughs> would we? I mean, so what is the response if we get that kind of question? Right? And that's that's a space that we have carved out for religious studies within society. But if we don't have that space, then what's left? Great question. Okay, so first of all, I think I was fairly cautious, as flippant as I was, and I, like I said, I'm flippant to a fault. Um, but as flippant as I was, I don't think that I ever said, um, let's not give our our graduates any job that they can possibly get. I <laughs> because we need to do that. Um, looking at like that, I have at least one former and one current student in the room. But um, no, I think like getting students jobs is very, very important. Um, and at the same time, I think that in the Japanese context, not Norway, but in the Japanese context, I think it's really important that um, the evidence that I've seen so far, and I have to admit this is a point of where I need to do further research, but the evidence that I've seen so far is like, the Shukyo Bunkashi credential is not what's gonna get you the job. And the Shukyo Bunkashi credential, I suspect, and this is, I, I wanna be clear, but I still need to do more research, I suspect is not what the like what the hiring principal is looking for. It's not the first, second, third, or fourth thing, right? Like it's just like, oh well, I guess that's cool if you can do that, right? Like and and um, that's very different from a place like Norway where you have Christianity, religion, worldviews, and ethics. Is right? <laughs> that right? Yes. You should have switched to ethics and worldviews, and then it could have been crude. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, but but I do think I, I mean. You know, if you can't beat them, join them. I think that's a very pragmatic response. Um, and I'm going to take that and circle back to the first thing that you said, which is about ritual and discourse. Why is the why did I focus so much on discourse? Because that's the world that we all inhabit. Scholars of religion are talking about these things in very abstract ways without getting down to the nitty gritty of being like, what's a human body doing in this space, right? And um, then when they do talk about it, it's often in negative terms, and that's where the scholars will distinguish what we do from what those other people. So like after Kimigayo and, and um, the Hinomaru who made the national anthem and flag in the 90s, uh, respectively, and then the Tokyo and Osaka metropolitan governments made it a requirement for all teachers to stand for, sing, or musically perform the national anthem, that's about bodies. That's about ritual. That's uh, about space. And when teachers refused to do that, the Supreme Court famously or infamously ruled that that was their duty as public employees to stand for, sing, musically perform the national anthem. The ritual was more important, right? Um, scholars of religion, the way that we have talked about things, we've talked about religion in terms of content, intellectual content. But I don't think that that's where the legal issue is, nor do I think that's really where the pedagogical issue is. I completely agree with you. It's ritual. And, and so the, uh, the Nippon Kaigi, Shin Seiren folks are actually, um, at least through that particular uh, reform, they got their way in a way that the scholars of religion didn't. The scholars of religion won the game uh, in, the, um, in the revision of the FLE in terms of carving out a little space for themselves, but it was a pure victory because they like you know, what do they get? Like, who's it, like, maybe somebody's going to get a job as a shinkyo right? But the the other folks, they they got the ability to get bodies performing rituals in public space. Yeah. And that's, I think, especially for the, for the shrine world folks, that's like, awesome. <laughs> you know? Thank you for joining so much. Uh, and just, just very uh, quickly, um, it's not really a question, but maybe a comment. Like you're just mentioning about the how everybody like got into you know Weber and this is again the six. I understand saying has that 
the 1990s article, like they co-authored with Yamanaka Sensei, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's it, it, they mentioned like it's precisely the the 60s and early 70s, like the the peak of the Weber Shukyo Shakai Gaku boom in Japan, right? And most of these people like are like so Hash Sensei, you know, Beso Kotsukahi san, but then you have uh, Obuchi Ichi and um, Yanagawa Keiichi, right? and all these people like who are like the successors in a way of like Shimoto, like are all claiming. Bavarian um, and trying to apply that to Japan. And what's interesting, like, and you were also mentioning that from the Buddhist side, that the Buddhists are looking to the Christians and saying, how can we do that? Right. And in the same, it's a little bit different, but they are also, that's the way, like, some clerical scholars, like in Buddhist universities mostly, like, uh, apply this, 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 this Bavarian theory. Like, they start with the whole, you know, Kamakura Buddhism is really just reformation. This is the the, the Japanese version, like many people, like actually think the peak of these kinds of theories is pre war, like in the 1920s and 30s. No, it's the 60s and 70s, mostly. And so that would be interesting to, to see that and connect to, to what you're working on. Maybe at least like to to, to connect that with the with the reception of better in Japan in the 60s and 70s. Like why people got so much into that. that would be sort of like maybe for when you finish the paper. <laughs> no, you really do. I think next week, I don't know. Don't make more work for me. Um, but no, I, I appreciate that connection. I'm not going to say a lot because it was a comment for the question, but I, I appreciate the, the connection. And we'll just say, I think the, um, I think that Weber was in the air. And I, I think we really need to pay attention to these trans Pacific reverberations, like Talcott Parsons sending Robert Bella over to find the Japanese analog to the Protestant ethic. And then Bella writes to Ugawa religion and then goes back. And then he like 10 years later, he writes his famous civil religion essay, which is not about Shinto, but it's really about Shinto. And then like all these other Japanese scholars are like picking up on the Bavarian sort of lineage and then they're applying it to Japan. Those things matter. That's our collective context. And it's the air that we breathe. And I think we have to, um, every once in a while, like breathe different air, right? Like just try, like be, become aware of the things that are being taken for granted. Yeah, I really like the paper was also like the, the you mentioned Bella, like it was translated into Japanese sixty two by Woody Show, right? Like yes. it was at the moment at Hodai as well. Like so, yes, yes, yeah. Just briefly, um, thank you for your uh, analysis showing the kind of continuity of years that I hadn't thought about before, and that there's something new today. Um, just a, a brief comment about the uh, uh, Um I was on the board <laughs> and Nihon Shukyo Rappai, along with Hayao Sensei and maybe I mean, when they were discussing uh, this. And it's exactly as you say, you know, there are various concerns raised. Um, but my impression, yeah, my impression is also at least that what first took over the top and made it, you know, Agreeable and past is that oh, this is offering the voice for super people, um, you know, which is declining, <laughs> and it, it's going to offer employment possibilities, you know. But you know, I'm kind of cynical about this too, but what's wrong with that? I mean, it, it, like, it's not just a cynical kind of power grab, but um, it, it does offer. An opportunity for reporting about religion mm -hmm. and certain minor <laughs> employment possibilities. So, yeah, maybe that's not what you meant to say, but yeah. I think this is a great, I, I love the question. And thank you, by the way, for uh, confirming the general gist of what those conversations were like. I've talked uh, in some detail about this with Fujiwara Satoko, but also, um, you know, I, I think that from my conversations with Inoue and Obutaka, like the that seems to have been the case. I don't think there's a problem with making a case for religious studies in public. I actually think we can and should make the argument that scholars of religion have something to offer to people. It's the supercilious attitude that we've inherited from Kishimoto, like that we know better than other people, that I think gets us into trouble. I think that gets us into trouble, and, and I recognize that I often will have a know-it-all attitude, and I recognize, I recognize the irony in this, but um, I think that supercilious attitude, you know, ends up making it sound like 
religious people don't know what they're talking about. And it actually, I think, can turn some people off who would otherwise be quite sympathetic to the things that scholars of religion have to say. It can turn them off to the sort of insights that we might, that we might have. Um, this is a place where I'm not going to name names, but there are some particularly powerful, uh, you know, scholars and senior scholars in religious studies who regularly use their platforms to say, this is good religion, that's bad religion. And I think that we undermine our credibility when we do that, right? But that's the, then, we're, there's, then we're doing theology. And if there's a difference between those two things, between the academic study of religion, the non-confessional academic study of religion and, and theology, some people will say there is a difference, some people will say there is no difference. But if there is a substantive difference between them, then I think that those sorts of claims get us into a lot of trouble because they they start to uh, they then we start to define orthodoxy. And like I said, I think that we stay on the safer territory when we stick to our discipline, as I was talking about with Clark. And, and focus on how some people are defining religion and how that affects our collective life. That's about citizenship, that's about democracy, that's about collective decision making. And that's where we actually have things to say that really, really matter to people. And we don't have to be saying, like, oh, those people are bad religions over there. Like, uh, to use the most recent example, like, oh, we need to investigate the unification church, right? Like, why would we need to do that? We can describe without getting into that territory. Thank you. I, I promise you, very short. Now, all this discussion is really interesting. I guess in the course of this, I would ask you um, both in your presentation and in the whole discussion session afterwards, where are the children in this, these voices? And I, I just want to point out the preface. Okay, 1956, uh, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, American band, came out with a great hit. No, 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 I'm not a juvenile delinquent. Very catchy <laughs> line. Okay. Ten years later, 1965, The Who in the UK came out with their first album, My Generation, which contained the song, The Kids Are All Right. And this is a response to the juvenile delinquency question. They were the delinquents. No one would argue with that. Pete Townsend, Roger Daltrey, Keith Moon are going to say, okay, they're the delinquents. And they say, hey, we're okay. We're cool. This is their, this is their song. So in Japan, where are the voices of the children? Do the children have agency? And is this something that you're going to address in your study? And is there some way where are they not allowed to have a voice in this discussion of what's going to be taught in the public school system? I have two answers to your question. I'll, I promise to be brief. In the scholarly discourse, the scholar of religion discourse, no kids, no voices. Kids don't matter. To be seen and not heard, right? Um, in other uh, issue in, uh, in broader discourse about education, not nearly as much as you would think. The one person is, uh, who has actually tried to give voice to the voiceless child um, who appears in my, in my account um, is the experimental filmmaker Hani Susu. I mentioned his 1961 film, Furyo Shonen, where he took juvenile delinquents who were living in a reformatory and made them into actors and he had them act themselves. And it was an astonishing, so if you haven't seen this film, it's really, really interesting. Um, soundscape's a little weird, but like the, he had these people basically like act out. And there was even one scene where he had them perform a robbery on, some, on an accomplice or on a, an acquaintance who didn't know it was happening. And Honey was secretly filming this. So they had this guy, they mugged this guy for real, and the guy is like crying and there's snot pouring out of his nose. And he's like, I have to take my watch, please. And it's all happening live on Honey's camera. But then he also has these very sensitive like portrayals of these young men, like scrounging up the tobacco to roll a cigarette or like loafing about in some cafe or ogling women on the street. Um, and just like, not that ogling women on the street is a good thing, but he's like trying to um, show what their world is like. And, when he's in roundtable discussions with other intellectuals of his generation, he's like, you guys have no idea what you're talking about. When I talk with these people, this is what they're saying. And then you get the, like, the PTA president who's like, well, the kids are consuming too much pornography. He's like, have you ever talked to a child, right? And so I, ju I just think that that's, that's very indicative of, of the broader context here, but I really appreciate the question. Okay, thank you. Um, so I get, and I totally agree, Right, that the scholars have been jumping at the chance to impact uh, education. 
But I'm still just a little confused, and maybe it goes back to what I was talking about, about what's happening on the ground, which is, did they? Like, did they really? Um, and as somebody who went through six years of Japanese public education in the 90s with very hyper uh Christian missionary parents to make sure I wasn't getting any kind of extra moral education, um, I really can't remember anything. <laughs> maybe I've just, you know, blocked it out, but I'm just really curious if you have any uh, thoughts on So is this a tempest in a teapot? Was it, you know, what was the real impact? Great question. I actually think that this is another thing. Okay. I think we overestimate our, our special impact scholars in religion um, quite a bit. And, um, you know, this came up a little bit in the conversation yesterday. JDRS is a great venue for all of us because we get to talk to each other and we can, like, kind of use some shortcuts and stuff like that. Um, we can use a little bit of jargon. And then it turns out, well, oh, we, we're really good at talking with each other, but not necessarily at, like, impacting broader things. You know, some of the scholars I mentioned, particularly Kishimoto, they did have a lot of clout. They were being paid attention. They, they you know, policymakers paid attention to them, but that doesn't mean that their ideas actually turn into policy. I'm quite fascinated with all of the energy that people will put into things that are quite, that are just obviously failed enterprises. <laughs> um, and indeed, the book that I'm uh, revising right now is full of all of these cases where people try really, really, really hard to make something happen and then it didn't happen. And I think that tells us something. Um, you know, our political scientist colleagues would be like, that indicates that the, the status quo was, was preferable to people than to like in, engaging in some sort of change. And I think that that's, um, you know, so in, in this case, there's foot dragging on the part of the Japan teachers union, that's clear. They foot dragged uh, morality education to the point where it basically became a non thing. Um, same same thing with any with anything else. Even why I tend to think that the principals aren't super into the Shugyo Bunkashi thing because like they could be like, okay, I'll hire you, but you're still just gonna teach math, right? Um, and and so like foot dragging these weapons of the proverbial weapons of the week, but also just kind of like if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? The only people who think it's broke is the scholars of religion. So I think it's tempest in a teapot, and that's and and I'm interested in telling a story about like. Do I dare say this? Um, <laughs> how much we don't matter? Because uh, I think you all think that it matters, and so it's really fun. <laughs> I really appreciate every question. Thank you. I think that's a good point to break off. So <laughs> thank you, Jonathan.